special exhibition as the closing of 2016, which is, has been quite an interesting year. Um, at least there's some good news today for Hong Kong people, at least. Um, and so um, this exhibition, a Creative Operational Solution, is a constellation of several components. As you can see, we have this amazing lineup of speakers, which um, we never have so many guests before. A talk of a show besides our international conference. Um, so as you see, um, this exhibition is actually starting from a residency project, um, which is funded by Maya Scott. Um, so Maya is an uh, artist and architect based in New York. She's the director of this uh, container artist residency program. So later Maya will tell us more about it. And so this is, I will quickly introduce everybody and then uh, we will give like brief introduction of each artist's project and the first name and then we will open to questions. So um, so this uh, residency project is funded by Maya and then the exhibition outside is um, a presentation, an outcome, um, to curate the bad parasite and um, Pran, um, let me not pronounce your last name properly. So Pran is a designer and curator based in, in New York. Um, he's the founder of P exclamation mark space, which is a critically acclaimed exhibition space in New York and uh, Project Projects an award-winning design studio in New York, which is also a very good friend of Parasite, that we did a very nice project on the play here a couple of years ago. And so Project Projects also designed uh, the space and the graphics is also designed by um, Project Project. And so um, together um, with this residency, there was a seven artists um, and the collective group were invited to join this residency program. And today we have three of them here with us today. And on my right hand is Tyler Corbin. Tyler is an artist based in New York. Um, if some of you have signed up this one-on-one uh, -on -one mysterious performance in Lightning, is, um, Tyler is actually one of the um, parts of this project. And then here next to uh, Tyler is um, Turo Von Bolland. And together with his uh, partner, uh, Rebecca Cohen, which is, uh, cannot be with us today, they're both based in London. Uh, many, probably many of the uh, audience here are familiar with their work, which they did a show earlier this year at Perlong, and then also the current, <laughs> it's important reference, and then also the current M Plus Design Show is also featuring the work. And then next to Pratt is uh, Christopher Page. Christopher is currently based in Athens, uh, which is the artwork that we showed outside is actually the outcome right after Christopher moved to Athens after the residence journey. And then at least in this um, Dan Mala, they're a Hong Kong based to do it. And they recently did a project at Holy Motors and then they are also they're not part of the residency artist, but for this Hong Kong um, addition that we add to three more artists to that, uh, in, especially for the Hong Kong edition. The demo was one of them, and also between uh, James T. Hong, a Hong Kong filmmaker slash artist from Taiwan, and also uh, Guo Xi and the Jin from Hangzhou. So as you can see, it's really a, like a lot of layers and components to talk about. So I would like to start with Maya. Um, so everything seems to start from you. <laughs> Uh, so, if, uh, yeah, I think that was appropriate. Uh, I don't know if this worked, but I don't think I need it. Okay. Um, I think the most appropriate um, uh, beginning to this is to tell the story of how this residency project uh, started. Um, I was in grad school studying photography um, at Yale University, and uh, within this uh, very um, uh, yeah, privileged institution. Um, I found myself without traveling home to Israel, where I'm from, uh, but not having um, uh, money to buy a flight back. So the idea of uh, uh, came from originally from a friend uh, as a joke to hop on a freight ship, and um, I thought, oh, it's a great idea, and I spent a whole summer um, in Israel and trying to get an approval 
able to travel on a freight ship and also take photographs while I'm traveling. So it was both um, means of transport that was free, um, but also a photography project uh, for, for that summer that I was in between the first year and the second year of grad school. And I came back and I had a lot of photographs and videos and I was showing, um, showing them, but they, they didn't, it felt like the kind of representation doesn't do, um, it, it, it needed to go beyond representation because for me it was a very strong experience because um, it was this new setting and uh, being in this vast uh, ocean and this very confi very confined spaces and seeing these like hundreds of thousands of containers moving around the world uh, also being disconnected from um, the internet while you're on this network that connects the world, you're basically disconnected. So it's really interesting platform. Also, um, as an artist, it was a very uh, interesting place to be, where you're surrounded with uh, by the crew of the ship that each um, has a very specific labor, and you have to kind of confront with your role as an artist um, in this kind of microcosmos. So uh, that was a very strong experience, and. Um, I was uh, developing it as a, I, I realized I could pitch it to uh, shipping lines as a public image project, essentially, um, so they can have um, artists on board. And this is where the, this kind of project developed, where uh, I pitched it to different shipping lines um, with a presentation. And um, in last summer, we, um, I started working with Prem, and we developed this first edition, and we launched an open call in um, 2000, in October 2015. Um, yeah, I don't know if we have time for more, so I'm gonna. <laughs> Later, I think we can sort of like open questions yeah. and have more discussion. So, Pran, and maybe you can tell us more how this idea that the exhibition comes out and also this, the download with Cosmic and Paris. Sure. Uh, what? <laughs> yeah, no, I'll actually. I want to just kind of piggyback on that for a moment because my role was I was brought in uh, as, as myself and as Project Projects to get involved in curating this initial edition of the residency. And to me, one of the things that was interesting and always in Mayan's uh, original idea was this idea of kind of reciprocity, but also of kind of negotiation and compromise. The idea that she wanted to create a residency program to put artists on board of commercial ships, um, but that this would be done very knowingly in kind of collaboration and partnership with a shipping company. And, and as a designer, um, one of the things that I always say is that there is no autonomy. Anytime you're kind of working as a designer, but also as a cultural producer, or really any producer, um, to extend the argument, you're always in some ways, you are dependent upon others, and you are kind of negotiating that role with them. And so um, whether or not that's apparent or transparent um, is is always a question. But um, so for me, that was always something interesting in the project. And for so I was brought in to curate the program, help to uh, organize the structure of the open call, and the jury who then selected out of over 2,000 applications, seven artists to go on this first residency. And over the last year since that process began, um, the role has been together with Mayan, and I should mention here, Asher Modis, who has helped tirelessly throughout the whole project to project manage it from New York. Um, to work with the artists and arrange each of their individual itineraries along a path that is existing. And so this was also an important part of it. Each of the artists could kind of construct their own residency along their own path for their own duration with the production money from the corporate sponsor. Um, and I think that you know one of the things that's interesting about that is also that it's a residency that happens not um, it doesn't happen in isolation. It's not a residency that's about going into a room and you know writing. It's actually one that happens in the world. And so I think that in thinking about how to conceptualize the first iteration of the exhibition, um, which will travel from here to two other locations, uh, I think that that's, those same considerations were really important. To think about the idea of um, autonomy as a privileged condition and one that actually rarely exists 
and to enact that within the exhibition design of the space. To think about, I mean, even the fact that I was very happy that we, this project when it came to Parasite, it was a collaboration between myself and Cosmet and Parasite in taking the original artists from this residency program and then extending the, that set of artists with other artists who could think about the conditions of kind of commerce and trade um, and compromise within the local and regional context. And so even that itself took the original idea and opened it up more. And for project projects on myself in designing the exhibition and thinking about how to both curate and design a space, it was also to think about the condition of, um, let's say, of tightness that exists within a kind of commercial, the, the situation of commercial shipping, but also to really enact, as I said, in the space, um, the idea that rather than being a white cube, actually this is a space that is lived and where there are individual artistic positions who are always kind of, in a way, um, dealing with the architecture at hand and the context at hand. that we included a 3 different artists and also the historical section that's especially for this show. I mean, I think what I would like to um, insist on, I mean, after thanking all of you for coming here and putting together this uh, exhibition, um, like why was this in so interesting for us uh, to take on and to integrate it into our programs and to um, collaborate as much as we uh, were able to do. I think there's an obvious reason why Hong Kong uh, makes sense for this project and it's something that uh, was already there before we stepped in. Uh, several of the artists shows Hong Kong as part of their itinerary and that's a um, testimony to the importance of, uh, of that the city has in global trade and in this globalized geography of, of, of seafaring. Um, and that's something that has been the case from the very beginning of Hong Kong and it's intimately and structurally connected to uh, the idea of Hong Kong and that's what she tried to show with the historical section that she found uh, related where um, we look at the beginnings of, of trade of Hong Kong and particularly to also like a, a history of opium trade because that's you know, I mean, a drug dealing city basically. Um, so this is, you know, this was the obvious reason. Um, now there was, there's something else in the project, and there's that underlying tension of, of the project, uh, and, and, and the kind of uh, complicated relationship between funder and artist, between uh, structure and uh, free agency, uh, all the discussions about autonomy that Pei mentioned. Um, that were also particularly interesting for us because this is something that in a context like Hong Kong and in many other contexts in Asia it's something that is still very much uh, uh, it's more than a subject of debate it's, it's uh, a day-to-day -day struggle to shape the institutional landscape to, to shape the ethical parameters of working in the arts so uh, it was important to bring this uh, project here with all its polemics and with all the kind of tension that, that, that it has there. Um, I mean, thirdly, and this is something that became more apparent, you know, after we decided to uh, bring the project to Paris, I think that, you know, the you know, great changes of 2016 that Freya mentioned um, are very paradoxical because they are, the that they are, you know, a, very much about bringing to power a certain oligarchy that benefits from this global trade, but the narratives that they based on is against uh, global integration, against a certain idea of like what globalization is. So this makes this and the topic of the exhibition very interesting because there wasn't that there isn't necessarily there's certainly not celebration of global trade as such in the exhibition. There's nothing to celebrate in you know something that is the backbone of the capitalist system. But at the same time, and this is, it, it, it almost become uh, uh, melancholic to, to, to refer to this era that is now uh, becoming the object of hate of the most reactionary forces that we have on the political stage internationally. So this is another uh, layer of tension and of paradox in the project that makes it particularly interesting at, at, at the current moment at, at which we're finding ourselves, whether we want it or not. Yeah, I think it, 
many of you might have a lot of questions to respond to the curators and ideas, but I think I would like to have some here, some opinions from the artists, because there are so many residency programs in the world, and then, but I think this container residency has provided very specific content that you know you spent very specific duration in a cargo ship. And so I think the audience, besides seeing the presentation, the outcome of the artworks outside, the audience must be very curious to hear about the artists and their journeys um, during this route and the trip. So Tyler, we will start. <coughs> sure. Sorry, I'm just pressing. Sure that mic works. Yeah, yeah. It seems that it needs a button. Is this working? Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Brad. Thanks for making this happen. I think one of the things that I really appreciated about this residency is you would assume, given the unique context for it, that there'd be an expectation to produce a certain type of work in response to the situation. And I really appreciated that throughout the process, Prem and my end were very open to uh, different ways of approaching how we worked in the context of these ships, where we transited in terms of the, the routes that we took. Uh, and, and where the, the projects could go. So the container ship, as you'll see in the show, in some of the projects really provides a topical context and for others uh, is merely an index of where some of the project was developed. Um, in my case, I ended up going from, from New York to, to Ashdod uh, and it took about three and a half weeks. Uh, and uh, you know, as Maya mentioned, the internet scenario uh, was effectively like a, a mail server that could send emails up to, I think, 120 kilobytes that were uploaded via satellite about once a day. So it was a fairly, uh, I got to know myself very well <laughs> in the experience. Um, and I went in with, with different plans uh, and, and doing a lot of research, of course, into the history of shipping, but the project that emerged uh, is a little more tangential, let's say, to the immediate concerns uh, of containerization. It's a three-part project called Resonator, uh, and it, its departure point is sort of a theory of scientific theory of, of resonant frequency, the basic belief that many materials in the world have a particular frequency that they're sensitive to, and if exposed to this frequency, will be excited to a potentially destructive state. And so an anecdote that provides a departure point for the project is of Nikola Tesla walking through Wall Street finding a building halfway under construction, attaching his oscillator to this building, even though there were steel workers like working on the building, just put it on the side and claimed you know, that he, had the workers not come down and called the cops, he would have been able to destroy the building. So I sort of take this as a departure point, imagining the capacity of residents to destroy capitals, right? And extrude that in different ways. So also looking at residents on an interpersonal level, looking at resonance in relationship to the body, because various parts of our body are sensitive to different frequencies. So thinking also about the body as the measure of new types of weaponization, the warfare, it moves in different directions, and that's partly why there's this sort of mm, tripartite uh, structure to the project. One component Freya mentioned is these off-site performances that I did last weekend and this weekend, and for various reasons, they're for only one person. Uh, they're near an MTR station. Um, if any of you are interested, come talk to me after. It, there, there are a few spots in the morning, and if you're like really an early bird, uh, we can have some fun. It's, it's, not, it's not as creepy as it sounds. But, uh, meeting a strange artist in an unknown location in Hong Kong. I, I recognize it's well. like morning. Uh, it's, it's, not, it's not suited to everybody, but uh, I promise I'll have fun. <laughs> Another component of the project in this space is this tuning fork. It's one of two that I've made. Uh, they're cast from bullet lead. Um, you know, all shipping industry is dealing with ships, but part of the reason I took the New York-Israel journey is because, you know, Zim is one of the companies that's involved in Israeli-US arms trade. Uh, I was on the ship with a lot of militarized trucks. I had to get someone drunk to tell me that. But on the way back, often what shipped are ammunition that are resold in America under a brand called Independence Ammo. So there's a more sort of complex narrative to, to the forks themselves, which I'm happy to tell anyone about. Uh, but one of them is here, and one of them uh, is in my possession. And at the conclusion of all the exhibitions, this fork will be given to Zim, so that it's a sort of secondary contract uh, on top of the one that I established with them. The third component of the project is online. It's, a, it's an online archive with schematics for building an oscillator to destroy financial capitalism. 
it's a work in progress. The files are Photoshop files, so you are all welcome to download it and realize this thing that I have begun with my friend Byron Peters. At some point during the exhibition, um, these materials will be disseminated through Parasite's email list, uh, but the link to the file is also online. Thanks. Thank you. Um, so, yes, also thanks. Um, Congo, Africa. We wanted to be, um, so when I say we, I work with my partner at Afro, we can be here. We wanted to be on this supply chain between China and Africa. And that was sort of why we applied to the, to the container residency. It's also like the product, what we applied with to the container residency. And the reason for that was that um, we've been doing a lot of work in, in China and various places around the politics of production, the ethics of mass production and industrialization. And at the same time, we've, we've been starting to do loads of work in Congo, in particular the east of Congo, where um, many materials that industrialization demand and dream of uh, come out of the ground. So the history of Congo is a history of, of natural resources, um, going back to ivory, after that rubber, copper, uranium, the atom bombs dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, contained uranium from Congo, uh, gold, diamond, and now coltan. And coltan is um, what they make uh, tantalum from, and tantalum is a little bit of Congo that you are all carrying around in your pocket, because every, every smartphone contains tantalum from Congo. Um, the east of Congo for 20, 30 years has been ravaged by war, millions of people have died, and these particular mineral resources, their extraction and the infrastructure and political infrastructure around it, um, relates directly to this conflict. And so we were really interested in the way that through these rare materials and these industrial processes and these kind of desirable objects, we were in some way or another connected to these political conditions, whether factories in China or mines in Congo. Um, and so we've been working on these things and when the container uh, residency opportunity came along, it felt as if it would sort of be traveling on these very kind of backstage capitalist infrastructure, but that is the actual infrastructure that connects to these things. Um, and so, of course, kind of reflect on this a little bit. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail about them, but that, that was sort of our starting point. Thank you. Chris. Hi, everyone. Um, so, uh, I'm a professor from London. Um, I, I studied in America with my actually. And um, the, she told me about the residency at, at the moment. Uh, when I, I moved from uh, London to Athens, um, because I've been, I've been there a couple of times, um, sort of involved myself with the migrant crisis. Um, and um, so I then, I then moved there uh, for all the time. And it was also a moment when, in my work, I was sort of, uh, I'm essentially a conformist uh, painter. Um, but it was a moment at which I was um, sort of moving, trying to extend that out into border, uh, border um, territory. Um, and I suppose I moved to Athens because of those things, but also because of this superposition upon um, classical antiquity. And I suppose I conceptualized it in terms of geometries almost, in terms of a certain kind of um, Directed linearity, which uh, goes along with a kind of uh, European myth, perhaps, um, maybe best exemplified by Hegel or something like that. And, and Athens is a place which is the kind of ground zero of those, those, um, of those myths, ideologies, or the people who them. And, uh, and also uh, ground zero of uh, uh, Europe. Um, and specifically Greece being, you know, essentially kind of bottomed out by much more complex, much more positive linear, if you like, flows of, of, of capital and people with um, a kind of economic restructuring, um, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, and so, in a way, I suppose I was uh, trying to put the container uh, uh, 
to seem to kind of offer an option to kids to, to sort of think those things through in a much more material and, and, and real way. And in a way, also, I, I kind of thought that container ships also contain a sort of uh, a kind of homology in the sense that there's this sort of directive in the aesthetic object, which is the, the container, and then there's the sort of knots and flows that, that it gets passed around on. So I suppose I was having quite kind of formal thoughts about, um, about the whole thing. Um, uh, so I chose to make a freeze. Um, it's, it's there outside, but it's a freeze that becomes, screws together to become a, a, its own shipping crate. Um, and the freeze is a form that comes from Ionia, which is um, the area which is, has been put free in Turkish throughout history. It's been fought over, it's also the region where migrants make the dangerous crossing. Um, and it's also, it's also, actually, I now think that it's actually Hegel, so it's, it's, it's also the painting with no center, it's a painting that goes on and on. So it's a way of um, sort of forcing rectilinearity to kind of become a, a flow, if you like. Um, and the, the, the residency has really been incredibly, uh, it's been incredibly product productive for um, because I employed uh, some migrants I was working with to paint. I mean, I wanted to make painting, and I suppose the only way to make painting, uh, or the most minimal way to make painting is to put paint on the surface. Um, and I, so I had, um, I paid some migrants I worked with um, to apply paint to the surface, so the white paint, and it's obviously white paint um, is a pleasant surface. Uh, by, uh, by migrants who I picked at Greek and which, uh, which is undoubtedly a very amount of work in cases undoubtedly the uh, what they'll be what um, if they do. And um, and so it became it became a kind of uh, 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 you know, I was trying to condense all these thoughts together into a, into a, into a piece of but but actually beyond that um, the residency itself is has been Kind of, uh, a kind of experience. In fact, I, mean, I can I can actually I can talk, sort of talk about it. It's, it's, it's been such a sort of uh, a, a remarkable sort of quality and sort of social experience. Um, and, uh, and it just feels like it keeps extending. You know, and you know, so these guys are also feel like um, that it's sort of where it's all it's all kind of an artwork of my own as well, which is, makes it a kind of strange uh, horizontal set of kind of nothings uh, and images and, and uh, translations, which I really appreciate as well. Um, Thank you. Um, so yeah, besides the uh, three artists participate in the residency program, we also have them uh, here, and, and they have outside of 230 very beautiful white in the ten porcelain objects up, up there. And then research as much as starting from Hong Kong and then travel to China. Do you want to collaborate a little more? Um, hello everyone. Um, thank you, Cousin and Ryan and Perth for inviting us to contribute to the show. We appreciate it. Um, so we're Jane Marla. Uh, I'm an anthropologist and, and voice is an artist. And <coughs> Working together now for a few years, um, we do research in terms of community-based collaborative scientific works. Um, the work out in the gallery is uh, a season in Shell, and it was originally commissioned for a Swiss museum in Zurich um, called the Johann Jakobs Museum, um, and it was formerly a private museum owned uh, and run by uh, one of the biggest uh, families in Switzerland who traded in chocolate and coffee um, and is now being reconfigured as an art and research institute with a cultural residues of the trade. It's a really interesting institution. Um, yeah, and much more research. Uh, we were commissioned uh, by the museum to do a project looking at the uh, economic relationship between China and Africa, um, which reflects uh, phases 
research. She did her field work in um, Kenya, and um, my personal um, is the result of a collaboration with a Somali asylum seeker who started a business in Hong Kong uh, trading abalone shells from the Red Sea uh, and abalone meat um, from the Red Sea to Hong Kong. Basically, he found that after the um, tsunami in Japan and Fukushima, the Fukushima um, uh, radiation <coughs> leak, which resulted from that, uh, all the pink abalone which was being sold to Hong Kong was contaminated. And the, the Red Sea off the coast of Somaliland, where our um, friend was from, was full of the same abalone. So we started a business. Um, basically, he retrained all these fishermen and formed them into a collective and um, to dive for abalone. And they collected um, 600 metric tons and were selling it in Hong Kong to secret restaurants 50 kilos at a time, as he was an asylum seeker. and not permitted to work in the country, so it was within um, black market streams. Um, so we, we did an exhibition based on um, this trade route, which we found. Um, so while he was bringing that baloney to Hong Kong, he was also exporting the shells of the abalone to China, which were processed into mother of pearl, which were then exported to Switzerland, uh, which were used in Swiss watch parts. Um, so, no, sir, Hong Kong jewels, um, so our exhibition was essentially, um, we worked with our friends to divert two tons of these abalone shells to the museum in Zurich. Um, so basically the museum became storage. Um, the exhibition was storage for the, for the um, shells for two months. Um, and so, I'll just add to that. Um, so we wanted to activate this, the museum space um, to join the trade route itself um, and kind of encompass a lot of the sensibilities that come with trade. So when you have two hundred, you know, two tons of smelly abalone shells in a pristine Swiss museum, it's very confronting. <laughs> yeah, and. Uh... <laughs> So that, that was a torturous process, um, actually, moving the shells, because Somalia is a, a arguably a failed state without a, a recognised government, and Somaliland is an independent state which is self-declared, and so any kind of paperwork from issued by that country is not recognised by any other port um, in the world. So it was a process of moving these shells from port to port to try and get them into Europe, um, and also moving money around <coughs> using these informal methods like the Wala, the Islamic banking system. Um, and we did the exhibition and what happened was um, our informant disappeared. Um, um, he was an asylum seeker and so he... He sent us a text message saying he could no longer stay in Hong Kong. Um, and we we assumed that actually his application for getting refugee status was denied and he felt he couldn't stay for any longer and moved on. Where he went, we do not know. Um, so that left us with two tons of abalone shells. Um, and basically it's been two, a two-year process of trying to work out what to do with those shells. And um, the end result has been um, these porcelain sculptures you see outside. Uh, essentially, when we were left at this kind of, uh, left at this loose end with, with this with tangible material objects, which just won't go away, um, <laughs> uh, the, the idea was just to follow the shelves <coughs> and see where that would lead us. And so we followed the trade route of the shelves and also all the associations shelves brought forth. So one of those was, um, the word, um, so we, uh, the word porcelain is actually from the Italian, which is porcellana, which means shell, cowry shell. And so it comes from um, the time during the, um, <coughs> the China trade, um, 
from the 16th to the 18th century, when porcelain was a type of white gold being traded with Europe. And, but no one in Europe knew how to produce porcelain. And they actually believed that it was made from crushed up shells, because it was the only material on earth that they could compare it to this translucent, hard, white surface. Um, so we ended up crushing the shells and get them out of the country and we extract the pure calcium carbonate from the shells and use that as a basis of the glaze, which we use to glaze these porcelain objects. Um, just add to that, um, I think also thinking about the, the work in its current form, it's radically different from obviously its, its original uh, existence from the Swiss Museum. It's not two tons of other little shells. Um, so it's become a bit of an archive of its own kind of trade journey through cultural institutions. The actual uh, table where porcelain table where you see just came from Sudo from a recent exhibition. Um, and that was the reason we did this table where it was a reference back to the banquet table we had in the first exhibition of the museum shell. And also uh, at the same time we had a sister exhibition on the museum in Missouri. Um, looking at the contemporary historical trade relationship of China between clocks and porcelain. And so it became kind of a complementary piece to for this sister exhibition. Now it's kind of taken on a new layer where we've got this, uh, this export art um, reference with the, in the design of the, of the metal structures you see outside too. Oh, I, I think, that, yeah, um, and I guess just to try and open up the discussion, bring it back to some of the comments Cosmo made at the beginning and some of the other um, artists have made. Uh, so in order to gain the trust of our informant um, during, um, to do this exhibition, we basically, he was setting up a, a Hong Kong office for a North Sudanese mining company um, and he asked us to become employees for his company, um, which we did for that period of time. And so we spent a lot of time um, going to bank meetings and working in his office and writing letters and, and experiencing the financial culture of Hong Kong. And he, the reason why he asked us essentially was because I'm Chinese and Daisy is white. And he felt that as an African, he was being discriminated against in Hong Kong within the business circles. And so he thought by having these nominal kind of <laughs> um, figures in his, in his fledgling business that it would help his chances. Um, but I mean, the inception of the actual work came from a time after when we had made friends with him and we were just discussing, uh, you know, politics and economics between Africa and Asian nations. Um, he called us up one day and said, I need your help in the hospital, I just collapsed on the street. Um, and he said, I'll tell you why business cannot work between China and Africa. And so we went, um, we went to see him at the hospital and he explained um, the situation where his bank accounts for his uh, company he had set up um, had been frozen and he was trying to move uh, excavators from Hong Kong ports to Sudan. Um,
I think that it's a good time to open the question to the audience and the audience and curators and all. So, anybody has some questions to curators and artists? I mean, I don't know, it's funny because it 
becomes a, it was such a kind of personal thing that it's kind of almost sort of you know, uh, cast in my villains or, or, or heroes of the, of the birds of the community. You do find yourself embroiled in a kind of, um, in, in certain kind of symbolic games which are, which are going on. Um, <clears throat> And sort of, um, you know, uh, kind of, you know, subterranean uh, mutiny and sort of angers and, and things. And you do, at the same time, by being, I mean, you know, I, I don't know about you know, but they certainly didn't know what to make of you know, I me. Mean, I they really couldn't place me. I mean, you know, some of them obviously thought I was an incredibly important person, some of them thought I was, you know, a, a complete waste of time. And, um, and, uh, and 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 so you and so you you know so you have like very different interactions. I actually just want to mention one interaction which I thought was incredibly um, funny. Uh, there was there were some people on the ship, especially those that worked in the engine room. They were attempted to be Russian or Russian grade, and they always had ear defenders on, and they very rarely spoke. They were very sort of tough and quite quiet. And um, one of them didn't say entire, didn't say a word in, in, in my entire in my entire journey. Um, apart from twice when he came up to me, I was carrying a, a painting of mine, which is essentially a, a black painting. I was, I was making some things on, on, on the ship, which I'm not funny. Because a black painting of what looked like something, I mean, most, of, most people came up to me and said, When are you going to start painting with that? Um, <laughs> and, um, and, and this guy came up to me on, in, in the elevator and took his earphones off and just said, Malevich, black square. <laughs>